Okay, let's talk briefly about how these ideas might relate to the Human Awareness Institute, its facilitators, etc., relating to the truths shared about this experience, about a you know, pattern over time of sexual abuse, etc., uh, between myself and the facilitators, but also the facilitators and the team and the facilitators and the, the rest of their clients and the public. So uh, the first thing it would suggest is that all truths, all useful truths, must address all of the various impacts, positive and negative, uh, bet between not only myself, but the clients of the Human Awareness Institute uh, and the facilitators who are the uh, kind of presenters of the various protocols. And so um, all data is owned and addressed and expanded to not in an either or paradigm, but in a paradigm that acknowledges all of the data points, addresses and responds to them. That's what responsibility is. Responds in a way that lifts well-being, primarily in the hierarchy of a professional relationship, the, the priority is the client, is the therapeutic patient. You don't go to a hospital to make the doctor feel good. You don't pay for health insurance with the primary goal of increasing the doctor's salary. The doctor exists to, to serve the client. Um, and so, the, the, and, and of course, the very low level of truth would be to control and suppress the data as the facilitators uh, have been doing to make sure the truth doesn't come out because the truth threatens the existing dogma and the loyalty is to the comfort zone of the dogmatist as opposed to the well-being of the circle. Um, and I think the next kind of general thing is that the facilitator experiences and understanding of reality are added to the narrative, not in an either or paradigm, but in addition. And it's worth acknowledging that, you know, while the data that I'm presenting and what I'm doing is a significant expansion on the data given to me, meaning the Human Awareness Institute has never recommended any of these books. They've not recommended uh, going outside and seeing a trauma therapist. They haven't ex included any of this data, which is why I'm you know, focusing on it. But that's not to say that, the, you know, that anyone involved doesn't have more to add, meaning read these books, but also these books. Uh, look at this experience, but also these experiences, because that expands the pool of truth rather than attacking the existing pool of truth. Uh, the next thing, kind of obvious response is to expand the circle further. I am not a trained sexual abuse therapist. There are very good ones out there. Bring them in, as I've asked repeatedly. Bring them in to give their perspective of this data and to provide additional safety and context for who? The people that the entire organization is founded to serve, the public, the therapeutic client, the workshop participant, and the team. Read books about the blind spots in this culture. Books about shame, books about the shadow, books about chauvinism at the deepest level. Look at these videos, most of which focus on the things that have been most suppressed, both within high and in the culture. Uh, and finally, more data gathered neutrally on all topics to create a 150 point or a 100 point data set for the team, for the facilitators, for the community. It's free these days. You have to ask the question, 
in a traumatically illiterate cult, in an emotionally illiterate cult, in a psychologically illiterate cult, you can't ask people to explain what they don't know they don't know. I didn't know that I didn't know trauma. The way that I knew it was I would have these dates with women in the community, and they would start behaving irrationally. And I would point out the irrationality. And rather than saying, oh, you're right, that's irrational, they would lie about it while freaking out on their face. And I thought, now I'm even more sure that this is irrational. Because on the one hand, their face is registering panic, and on the other hand, they're denying the obvious in front of them. And they didn't know that they were demonstrating traumatic symptoms. I didn't know what trauma was, so I certainly didn't know they were demonstrating traumatic symptoms. However, if anyone at high at all had bothered to gather data and said, have, how many of you have dates within the community where your partner begins to act irrationally, one, and simultaneously they express a fight, flight, or freeze dynamic. I would have said, me, me, that's going on here, 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 and here, and I have no idea what to do with it. Well, now we have useful data, because if we're committed with any integrity to the community or, or me winning, I'm part of the community, so are these women. We would then say, aha, 25% of the time, our community is encountering trauma, and 100% of the time, they don't know how to deal with it. Okay, if we're committed to them winning, we have to become a trauma-literate community. That's responsibility. You gather the data, and then you respond to it. And if you say, well, we don't know how to deal with that in the facilitator body because we're not trained trauma people, then you respond to that. And you say, okay, uh, anyone out there know a good trauma therapist? Because we need help doing stuff we don't know, we don't know what to do with. And if the answer is yes, then you bring them in. And you either train the facilitators in trauma or bring in trauma experts to educate the community or refer the community to trauma experts. Uh, and meanwhile, you help everyone understand the terrain enough to know when they need help and to know the, the language. Well, that's just on one question. What about rape or saying yes when you mean no and this? How many are experiencing that? How many of people in the community are doing, uh, are having sexual experiences where they regret it later and they knew they would regret it later, but they still said yes? In other words, how many of you are finding the paradigm of asked for permission and saying yes or no to work versus ask for permission and saying yes or no and it not working because for some strange reason, I'm not saying what I really feel and just being told to say what I really feel isn't working either because I'm still not doing it and I don't know why. Okay, how many people are in that camp? And what do we need to do there? Well, it's similar. These are traumatic abuse contracts where it wasn't safe in childhood where you felt you would die if you told the truth. So, and romantic relationships trigger that deep psych, you know, that deep terrain, etc. So again, back to trauma, traumatic abuse, etc. So, <clears throat> so these are some of the directions. And then of course, you keep gathering data. To respect, to see, and see again, you keep gathering data. And what you're looking for is a trend. <clears throat> So that, you know, 
a year from now, there are fewer of those traumatic events than there were a year ago. And a year then, there's fewer. And if your theory, your admittedly inadequate framework of truth, helps you make progress year over year in human well-being, then you use that truth. If it doesn't, if you plateau and no one's getting, you know, we're just, we're not getting rapes down to less than one per thousand per year, then the theory is inadequate to continually make progress. It was a good enough theory to get you to, you know, one in a thousand, but it's not a good enough theory to get you beyond. So what's the next theory? Then you may look at power dynamics. For example, it is a fact that when you have sexual relationships between party A, who is bigger, physically stronger, more politically connected in the community, and more financially successful, and partner B, who is homeless and insecure, smaller, and less financially stable. It is a statistical fact that when these partner A's and partners B's meet up sexually, that partner A will ask for their 100% and partner B is going to say yes when it's not what they want, but it is what they believe will please the stronger person in the relationship upon which they depend emotionally or financially or politically within the community. That is a reality. So how do you solve it? Is it by being decent enough to ensure that for committed members of the community, we are all going to pool together to see that there are no people struggling for pure survival and security and basic love and belonging in the community, thus leveling the playing field, not by knocking those who have that down, but by pooling support and resources and monitoring those in a vulnerable position and lifting them to a point where they can afford to tell the truth because they're not re-triggering survival contracts from childhood with an abusive family structure that demanded that they sacrifice their soul, their being, in order to please uh, the power structure of the parents, of the school, etc., etc., which is what we do in this cult. In other words, in an abuse cult, it is irrational to express, expect honesty for people in survival, in security, who don't have any sense of love and belonging and low self-esteem. In that situation, in an abuse cult, the most vulnerable people are preyed upon to meet the needs of those who have more power, much like myself in a vulnerable position, was preyed upon to accommodate the unethical and illegal needs of the facilitator body to suppress the truth and avoid giving adequate support for a therapeutic client in severe traumatic need, whose need included transparency and integration, while the facilitators believed that their need was for secrecy. Now, it was not for secrecy. If the facilitators cared all about their work, their need was for understanding, learning, <coughs> and to protect the public. But their perceived need, the need of their fear and their shame, was to hide what was going on at the expense of their abuse. Uh, survivor. So if the facilitators 
are willing to throw away a human life, a human heart, the dignity of a therapeutic client while being paid like that. You don't think that a sexually frustrated male in that situation is going to say, wait a minute, I don't really think you want to have sex with me, as opposed to exploiting that power? You see, in, a, in, in an addictive, shame-based cult, what the facilitators do in a shame-based dynamic like this is normal. And if I had had love and belonging in strong support, real love, as opposed to the, the, the lip service, you see, you know the difference between real love and lip service when you write to every participant and team members and you have people saying, I'm there for you, you're not going to take the hit for corrupt, fear-based facilitators. We care enough about this community, the future of this work, and we care enough about the principle involved to protect your life, period. And you have five or six volunteers right there. In an abuse cult, everyone abandons the most vulnerable because they don't want to be antagonized with a corrupt power structure, which is why the team member that assisted me did so on condition of my not revealing their identity to the facilitators that had already abused them and that they felt confident would abuse them again if there was a tension between facilitator ego image and what was uh, good for the therapeutic client. And so this is the direction of uh, healthily embracing, a, you know, and climbing the hierarchy of truth uh, in this situation.